Round of applause for Richard. <laughs> So, <clears throat> one thing you've probably noticed is that digital technology is a system for tracking everyone. And that's why I've never, for instance, done uh, a digital payment. I won't do it because I believe in paying cash. But it's quite clearly useful to be able to pay for something over the internet. In fact, it can be made ethical. <clears throat> Someone I know uh, has developed, has designed a system and wants to implement it for digital cash that would enable people to buy something, pay, say pay for a service over the internet without that person's identity being known. So for instance, you could pay to download something, or you could pay an email service to let you use it. And you wouldn't have to reveal who you are. Now, <clears throat> Bitcoin doesn't do this. You've probably heard of Bitcoin. Anyone can use Bitcoin the thing is, all transactions with Bitcoin are published, so it's possible to identify who the parties are. It's not automatic, but if you see that this Bitcoin account has bought this, this, and this, you, especially if you are Big Brother, you may be able to figure out who this is. Now, if I'm going to buy, say, an ebook, I don't think anyone should be able to find out what ebooks I have. This is a matter of elementary privacy rights. In addition, in some countries possessing, such as the United Kingdom, for instance, possessing certain co copies of certain ebooks is forbidden. It's a crime. You can be put in prison just for having a book. So, <clears throat> and people are. So, I think that, we, that our choices of what books to download should not be known to anyone. But if we want to be able to pay for them, that needs anonymous digital cash. So, the general idea of the system is people can get their digital cash from a bank. Now, the bank would know who you are. It would know that you got, say, $100 worth of digital cash. Later, you could use this digital cash to pay for things from various websites, and the website's operators would go to their banks to turn the digital cash back into dollars. But the clever part, which works through encryption, and I don't understand in precise detail, arranges that even though the bank signs these numbers and says that they're valid digital cash, the bank doesn't know what numbers it has signed for you. So when you spend them to, at a website, the website can go to the bank, which will say, yes, this is a valid digital cash number. It has never been spent before, but it can't tell who you are. The result of this is it's just like going to a store and paying cash, physical cash, which is the way I buy things. It's, it makes the internet give the same respect for your privacy that physical commerce gives. <clears throat> this is one thing we desperately need to do to turn around the tendency for digital technology to, bec to become a system of total massive surveillance. <clears throat> By the way, Apple just made a, an upgrade, so-called, in its browser and other software that causes it to send personal information about what people are doing to Apple. But you can see any company with enough power to do this to somebody and get away with it is doing it. <clears throat> this is what you get with 
digital technology that's under the control of companies. We've got to take away their control, and free software is the way to do that. Now, you may be interested in how free software developers typically work together. <clears throat> There's no rule about this because every free software project is set up by a group of people. It's completely independent of anybody else unless they choose to affiliate with some larger project. So they can run it however they wish. A few developers could simply write everything and put it out there. But what's most common is that they keep every version of the program publicly on display in a site that's typically called a forge. So you can look at every version and see how the versions change. You can compare any two versions. You can see what changes were made and who installed them, and typically there's an explanation as well. In addition, you can send them a change you propose and they'll look at it, and if they like it, they'll put it in, because they want your help in making their program better. This is a practice that was pioneered by Mr. Torvalds, who developed the kernel Linux that's normally used with the GNU system. <clears throat> so this is a way of getting people, perhaps around the world, to collaborate in a project which then becomes useful for everyone. People often ask me how much free software development is in a certain country. I haven't the faintest idea and part of the reason is that to a large extent you can't localize free software development to any particular place. These methods make it so easy for people in in different continents to work together, that that has become normal. And therefore, you can't say what place that project is in or how much free software work is going on in any particular country without doing a, a lot of work, which would be interesting academically, but it wouldn't mean what these people think it would mean. <clears throat> now, it's interesting to look at ways that people can get paid to work on free software. Now, free software is free as in freedom. It doesn't mean zero price. It doesn't mean that we think sh people should not get paid. What it means is we insist that software respect our freedom. If it doesn't respect our freedom, we say, this is evil, it will mistreat us, we don't want it. I'd rather have no software than a program that mistreats me and trashes my freedom. So the first question in how do we motivate people to develop software is, what software should people develop and what people should, software should people not develop? And our answer is, a non-free program shouldn't be written at all. If it's not going to be distributed in a way that respects our freedom, it's better if they don't write it. And this turns the usual question sideways, because when people raise the question of how to pay people to develop software, they assume that the goal is to, quote, develop software, unquote, which presumes that it do whether the program's free or not is a minor detail, what you want is to have software. Well, we don't agree with that. We say if a pro we want software if it respects our freedom, and if it doesn't respect our freedom, we won't use it anyway, so we hope it won't be written because it's, it would only be a trap in attracting other people who don't think about this issue to become users of that program and lose their freedom. So we want to encourage people to develop more free software and discourage the development of proprietary software. Ideally, there would not be any. Now, the next point is you don't have to get, you don't have to pay people to get free software because lots of people want to do it as volunteers. So, 
may be the answer to how do you make a living and work on free software is you get some other job and you work on free software in your spare time. But clearly this is not ideal because you only have some amount of, a limited amount of spare time to do this. It's better if we could enable people to work full time on developing free software. And in fact, there are people who do. <clears throat> in 1985, I sold copies of my free software. And I could have lived on the money I was getting from that. But then I founded the Free Software Foundation, and it seemed right for the foundation to take over the sale of copies. So I started selling support. I would add features to the free programs I had written in exchange for money. And I made a living that way for several years. In fact, I discovered I could make a living that way in seven weeks of paid work per year. And that meant enough to spend plus an equal amount to save plus an equal amount for taxes. <clears throat> of course, it helps not to have a profligate lifestyle. If you, are, if you fall into the trap of trying to compete with other people in how much stuff you can get, of course, you'll never have enough. But I avoided that. Nowadays, there are companies that do that, uh, quite a few. And cooperatives, there's a, an important one in Spain, for instance. And they have set up in many countries a chamber of free software commerce uh, to pressure for the government to commission more free programs so that they could conceivably compete for this business. <clears throat> now, governments, of course, fund the development of many programs to do specific jobs that the government needs. The government can perfectly well insist that that be delivered as free software. Of course, it'll still have to pay the people to write it. That kind of thing volunteers are not interested in. The users who want those programs will always have to pay. So why not insist that the results be available to society for other kinds of use and, re and respect the government's comp computational sovereignty as well? Governments should refuse to use non-free software because governments do all their computing for the people. And if they lose control of that computing, they have failed in their responsibility to the people. So every program used in any public agency must be free, especially if the agency does a critical job because then the presence of a proprietary program with its probable back doors threatens national security. Governments must not take the risk of using a proprietary program. Anyway, <clears throat> this supports people writing free software and could support a lot more. Now, <clears throat> another method that works nowadays is just asking for donations. For instance, in the GNU project, we have a program called Lily Pond, which is used for editing musical scores to make them look nice and print them or play them. You could also do that through another program. Anyway, the person who develops Lily Pond gets his income from donations from users. This doesn't work for all free programs, but it works occasionally. However, you can take that to a new level, a higher level with crowdfunding, where you go to the public and say, pledge money when there's enough money, then we'll do this project. For instance, the distributed social network diaspora was funded that way. <clears throat> so that's all I have to say. Uh, unless there's some issue that people would particularly like me to cover. Okay. <clears throat>